Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a book haul. I know, uh, but I actually have been unhauling quite a bit lately, and so the ratio of things that have been coming in is actually extremely low compared to the ratio of things that have been going out. Uh, so I don't feel guilty about this at all. For the most part, this is a used bookstore haul, but I did get a couple things new, and I also went to a book warehouse, so essentially an outlet store um, for books. Me and my mom went there yesterday and we both uh, got some books, so I will include them both here. And I think this is a pretty eclectic haul. I have some classics, uh, I have some adult fantasy, and I have some historical fiction. Uh, so let's just get right into it. Starting with my kind of adult fantasy haul, uh, I picked up A Brightness Long Ago by Guy Gabriel Kay. This is his newest work. It came out a couple of years Years ago and it is set in a fantasy version of Renaissance Italy. So far as I know, this focuses on a character who is working for um, a very mean guy that they call the Beast, and there is a girl who intends to kill the Beast, and I assume uh, their plot lines will converge. Maybe there will be a little bit of a romance. I don't know. All I know is that I did read my first Guy Gabriel K a a couple of months ago, uh, which was his book kind of set uh, in a Viking England-inspired country, uh, so I think he writes everything and it's all set in this one fantasy world. But that book focused on Viking England and essentially Alfred the Great. And it was fantastic. It was so good, five stars. I really love the way he writes. Uh, and so I decided to try his newest book when I saw it on the shelf uh, because I am such a sucker for Renaissance Italy. So I'm hoping uh, that maybe this will prove to me that Guy Gavriel K is a new favorite author. I also picked up new The Bone Shard Daughter by Andrea Stewart, and I believe this is an East Asian-inspired fantasy that deals with bone shard magic, so like these little creatures, if I'm not mistaken, are kind of constructed out of bone, uh, and they can be like the guards for this world. Uh, they can do things for you, but they're only as powerful as kind of the magician that created them. But the main character is the daughter of the emperor, and she has no memory of something that happened to her. I think something traumatic happened and she lost essentially all of her memory. Uh, and so the emperor does not really want her to inherit unless she can remember everything he taught her and everything about their family. So he's constantly testing her on her memory, I believe. So it kind of seems a little bit to me like there's going to be a mystery element to this. Uh, so that sounds really exciting to me and I've heard very good things about this. So I am really, really excited to pick this up in May. I also picked up a historical fantasy that just sounds so up my alley, it's unbelievable. So this is A Declaration of the Rights of Magicians by H.G. Perry. Uh, and apparently this is a historical fantasy set during the French Revolution. I believe Robespierre is a magician. Uh, and so I just am really excited to read this because apparently it has Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell vibes. But apparently this also takes place a little bit in England and William Pitt is also a magician. So I'm very curious to see how this works. Uh, so it is big and it's apparently the first book in a series, so I'm hoping that I really, really enjoy it. Next was a really anticipated release for me this year. This is Odin's Child by Siri Peterson. And so this is a work of translated fantasy. This is translated from the Norwegian. Uh, this is a very, very popular fantasy series in Norway, and I believe the next two books will be released in English later in the year. And so this is actually YA fantasy, I believe. This has been slotted in YA fantasy in translation, uh, so I'm not sure or if in Norway they would consider it YA or not, but this is apparently kind of a Norse mythology inspired fantasy world, as you might can guess from the name Odin's Child. It's really big. It sounds really intriguing, and so I'm just really excited to see more translated fantasy on the shelf, specifically Scandinavian fantasy. Uh, so I am just really, really excited about this. I can't believe how big it is. Hopefully the other two books are just as big and hopefully I really, really enjoy this. Moving into some of the used books that I recently picked up when I went to the used bookstore, I got a new edition of Dante. I do collect Dante. And so this is the entire Divine Comedy in the John Chiardi translation. And so I actually have found that I really enjoy this translation. I've dipped in and out of it quite a bit now. I really like the notes. There are quite a bit of notes in this. But I also just really like 
his translation because he does try to keep Dante's rhyme scheme in it. And I think that's incredibly hard to do in English, but I think he's done it pretty well. I'm a little bit shocked that you don't hear very much about John Ciardi. Uh, he's kind of a classic translation at this point, and so I am really excited to maybe read this in full one day, but it has been really fun to read it in part alongside uh, the Mark Musa translation, uh, which I have been reading recently. So this is one that I have already really enjoyed, and I'm happy to add to my Dante collection. I also picked up used The Poet and the Vampire, and you might can guess from this title alone, from the tiny portrait. Uh, this is a nonfiction book about Lord Byron and essentially the creation of the vampire. So this, I think, is going to go into his relationship um, with Dr. John Polidori, who was his personal doctor, his personal physician. And he essentially wrote the first modern vampire story. He was present at kind of the gathering of Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, and Mary Shelley. And Lord Byron said, write me a ghost story. And John Polidori wrote the vampire and Mary Shelley Shelley wrote Frankenstein, so I'm not sure how much Mary Shelley plays into this, but I think it's going to look at how Lord Byron inspired certain monsters like Frankenstein and the vampire, because John Polidori's vampire is very heavily based on Lord Byron. Uh, so this sounds really exciting. I was really pleased to find this at the used bookstore. I've not heard very much about it, so I'm not sure how... Um, romantic scholars really feel about this book, but I am really excited to get into it. Now it looks like we're in my little stack of classics that I got at the used bookstore. Uh, so the first of these is All's Well That Ends Well by Shakespeare. I am now collecting the Oxford World's Classics Shakespeare editions, and I've been really lucky that at the used bookstore I found quite a few of the plays that I haven't read, and for the most part the plays that I have not read have been um, the comedies. And I tend to think I won't really like the comedies. I tend to think that I probably won't like All's Well That Ends Well. But I do think it can be a good thing to get out of your comfort zone with an author. Uh, so I'm hoping that I can find a comedy that really agrees with me. And maybe All's Well That Ends Well is one of them. Next up, I picked up this little book called My Secret Book, and it is by Petrarch. And Petrarch is essentially a contemporary of Dante. He is also an Italian poet of the 1300s, and Petrarch is credited with essentially kind of coining the term Dark Ages uh, and essentially also bringing in the Renaissance. Uh, and so he was a poet. This is actually not a book of his poetry. I have been trying to find a really good edition of Petrarch's poetry for a very long time, and I can only find like heavily edited editions. So this is not his poetry. This is actually his kind of imagined conversation with St. Augustine or St. Augustine. I know that most people say St. Augustine, but we have a city here in the United States in Florida named for him, and it's called St. Augustine here. So I just can't bring myself of the habit. But this is apparently an imagined conversation between him and St. Augustine where they talk about religion and love and everything like that. I have never heard very much about this. Normally when you hear talk of Petrarch, you were talking about like very specific love sonnets. Uh, so I am excited about this, but I'm also a little bit apprehensive. I wonder if it might skew a little bit philosophical for me. I also picked up The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens. This is one of Charles Dickens' works that is on a five-star TBR prediction from me. I feel so sure that I am going to love this, and I really feel like he's just gonna rip my heart out with this one. I know absolutely nothing about the plot of this. I just know that Little Nell is in it, and Little Nell is one of the most famous characters in all of Charles Dickens' works. In the days since picking this up, I have frequently thought about going on and starting reading it. I do kind of want to hold off. I might actually want to save this until Victober this year, but I just feel sure that I am really, really going to love this one. Next, in terms of classics, we have three things by Ovid, uh, who is one of my favorite ancient poets. First, we have the Fasti, which was written by Ovid when he was in exile. This is actually Ovid's last major work of poetry. Uh, and these are really, really beautiful poems, if I'm remembering right. I have never read the Fasti in its entirety, but I do remember really liking what I've read of it. I just tend to really like Ovid. Uh, Ovid is a poet who works really well for me. This focuses a lot on kind of the religious beliefs of Rome's people and the ties between Roman citizens uh, and the gods. If I'm not mistaken, too, 
too. This might also be his work that's about the Roman calendar, uh, which is really fascinating. Uh, so I really do think that I am going to really enjoy this when I get into it and decide to really finish it out. I also picked up the erotic poems by Ovid, and this is exactly uh, as the title implies. This is poems kind of all about sexual desire and every stage of sexual desire that you could feel for another person. Uh, and so these are some of his most celebrated works of poetry. It is posited that this work might have contributed to his banishment. Uh, and this is one that I also have not actually read to completion. Uh, so I will be interested to finish this one out as well. And last but not least in my Ovid collection, I did get a new translation of the Metamorphoses. And this is the translation by Alan Mendelbaum, who is a really, really famous translator. Alan Mendelbaum has translated um, Virgil. He's translated Dante. And so this is his translation of the Metamorphoses. And I am really excited to read this because I tend to like Alan Mendelbaum's translations, but I also have struggled with the translations of the Metamorphoses that I have. So I have two Penguin translations, an older one uh, that was kind of in those pocket mass market paperbacks, and then I have the newer Black Spine classic, and I don't think either one of them was all that great. A lot of people swear by the Oxford World's Classics translations of ancient classics, and so that might actually be the edition that I should go with. But uh, I do think the Metamorphoses can be hard to translate. I did spend a lot of time in the Metamorphoses in Latin. In Latin class, we did translate quite a bit of Ovid. So this is a work that I've actually read quite a bit of in the original, and I don't know if that makes me believe that it's more difficult to translate than something else. But The Metamorphoses is potentially my favorite epic poem of the ancient world. I just really, really love it. This is all about uh, kind of the Greek and Roman myths. He is telling the kind of Greek and Roman myths to a new Roman audience, and it essentially goes from creation up to the point where Julius Caesar is deified and turned into a god to be worshipped. It's a really, really interesting work, and there is kind of a political component to it as well, as there usually is in the reign of Augustus. If it was written in the reign of Augustus, the work might have a bit of a political bent. This is one you get something new out of every time you read it, so I highly recommend Ovid. And last but not least, I will get into the stack that uh, my mom and I got yesterday when we went to the book warehouse. So the deal was four paperbacks for $20 and three hardbacks for $20. And so we split, one of us got the paperbacks, one of us got the hardbacks, and we will probably both read everything in this list. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty great deal. The first thing that I have to show you uh, is A Dangerous Inheritance by Alison Weir, and I hear you. I hear you asking, Jenny, why are you reading Alice and Weir? Don't you not like her nonfiction? And I tend to not like her nonfiction, you're right, but uh, I've never tried her historical fiction, and this book really got me. So this is apparently a dual timeline narrative, and one timeline is taking place during uh, Jane Grey's reign, and when Jane Grey is taken into the tower before she is executed, and then an earlier timeline is happening with Richard III's illegitimate daughter and she comes to the tower to essentially find out what happened to the princes in the tower and so this is all about crimes I think that happened in the Tower of London and I really didn't need to hear anything else I just needed to hear that Richard III's illegitimate daughter was in this and I think that I'm probably really going to enjoy it her portrayal of Richard III will likely not be very sympathetic uh, that's kind of Alison Weir's shtick if I'm remembering correctly now Alison Weir is a historian so I'm kind of wondering if in her historical fiction if she strays very much from the historical record I'll be interested to see if she does we also picked up A Conspiracy in Belgravia by Sherry Thomas, and apparently this is unfortunately the second book in a series in the Lady Sherlock series. I think we can get our hands on the first one pretty easily, and so this is essentially kind of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, I think retold with women playing the roles of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, uh, and so I'm always a little bit intrigued by things like that, and I really do have fun in the Victorian period, no matter what. And I believe these books will also kind of twist the original mystery on their head. Uh, so if you were very familiar with Sherlock Holmes, I don't think 
that this will just be telling you the same thing over again, if I'm not mistaken. This is a very popular historical mystery series. Uh, so I am really excited to read this and I think that I will probably really enjoy it. My mom will also definitely really enjoy it as she's far more of a mystery reader than I am. I then also got My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier, and so I just really wanted a paperback copy of this. I have never read My Cousin Rachel. I used to really, really like Daphne du Maurier years and years ago. Uh, she was one of my favorites because I adore Frenchman's Creek. Frenchman's Creek is one of my favorite books of all time, and I think it will remain so, and I also really, really love Jamaica Inn. Uh, but I have never read her big books, My Cousin Rachel and Rebecca. I believe the title character, Rachel, uh, was married to our main character's cousin who dies under mysterious circumstances so she kind of comes to live with him on his estate in Cornwall uh, and I believe some shenanigans ensue from there. Uh, knowing Daphne du Maurier it will be very twisty and so I am really excited about this one. I would like to read this also in the month of May because there's kind of a modern classics readathon going on being hosted by uh, Katie from Books and Things and so this would be a really good option for that I think. Last of the paperbacks that I picked up is God Blind by Anna Stevens. And this is a fantasy that I have seen around for a very long time and I've always been intrigued by and I've always really wanted to read. It is apparently grim dark fantasy, which sometimes I struggle with. Sometimes uh, it can be a little bit too dark for me because I do read to relax. I don't read to be more stressed out, you know? But I think this has to do quite a bit with this fantasy world's gods and I am always really fascinated by fantasy religion. I really love to read fantasy books that are really rich in religion, that really discuss the fantasy to see religion because I just find that absolutely fascinating, different mythologies. Uh, and so I think I'm probably really going to enjoy this from that aspect. So this is another fantasy that I am really, really excited to get into. Moving into the hard covers, which are all historical fiction, uh, we picked up The Secret We Kept by Laura Prescott, and this is apparently a bit of a Cold War thriller, and it's all about the publication of Dr. Zhivago by Boris Pasternak, uh, which was a really revolutionary book, and it was banned in Russia, I believe, and they sent it to Italy to actually have it published. Uh, and so this was a very, very interesting story, um, how books actually kind of fought the Cold War, uh, which has always been very fascinating to me. Literature had a very important role in the Cold War, uh, and Dr. Zhivago in particular did. I think this is going to be about both the publishers of Dr. Zhivago uh, and the women who surround Boris Pasternak as he is writing it. Uh, so I am really fascinated to read this. So it is definitely a book about books, which I know a lot of people People really love. So if you're on the hunt for something like that, uh, you might like this. My mom actually found The Witchfinder Sister by Beth Underdown, and I had never heard of this, but this is apparently inspired by a true story, uh, and it's about a guy who actually was a witch finder in the 1600s. He was paid to come root out witches uh, in smaller communities. And I believe this book focuses in on his sister who doesn't really agree with what he's doing. Uh, but this is apparently inspired by a true story which sounds really fascinating. I believe this takes place in England. Last but not least, I'm taking another chance on Alison Weir, and I got Jane Seymour, The Haunted Queen. Uh, so this is in her series about the six Tudor queens. I don't believe you need to read these in order at all. I would imagine they're kind of on the par of Philippa Gregory's books in that you don't really need to read these in order. If you do, I again imagine it won't be that difficult to find the first two. Uh, and so Jane Seymour is a queen that I think has been ignored a lot in historical fiction. So I'm really excited to see a book about her be this large. She is, of course, kind of the most favored of Henry VIII's wives because she does give him a son. Uh, so I imagine this actually might be a fairly rosy portrait of Henry VIII, and it might be a fairly rosy portrait of their relationship because I think certainly this was a very um, happy relationship for Henry VIII. If you have read this series, I would really love to know your opinion on it down below and whether you think it really compares to other Tudor fiction. I know there's a lot of Tudor fiction out there and there's a lot on all of the different queens of Henry VIII. So I would love to hear what you think of this down below. So those are all of the books that I have been hauling recently. I would love to know if you have read any of these and if you have also been hauling recently. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.